मो महेश को मे तपिया कले हे स्कान से मो जागे मो महेश को मे तपिया कले हे स्कान से मो I was born in St. Lucie County, 1922. Were you born on the reservation in St. Lucie County? No, I was born in the woods. Every time the baby's born, they build a little chicky for her to come and sit in that chicky for four months. She can't come into the camp and eat. She has to cook her own food and eat in her little chicky for four months. It's a medicine, you know, the, the four months is how long we mourn. You know, it's actual mourning phase is four months. After four months, the baby gets the first haircut, gets its official Indian name, and you know, so four months is part, part of, a, of, of a set ritual. My dad used to hunt games. That was his living. I used to go with him hunting as I got older. I used to like to hunt with him. I used to go with him all the time, every time he goes. He always tried to leave me, but I always go. I killed my first deer when I was six years old. My mother makes dolls, she makes baskets, she does beadwork, and she does patchwork. It's very sought after, and she's she learned it from her mom, who learned it from her mom. I made my first dress. My grandma said it took me three months to fin finish my dress. I think I was about six, seven years old. I played more than I saw. She's never written anything down or, or drawn anything, you know. She sits and thinks about what she's going to do, then she picks out the colors and then she starts sewing. If I have to do the patchwork and everything, it'll probably take me about a week. I think her gift is like uh, blending the colors. She says there's certain colors that appeal to the eye, and she says if you put this color with that color, it makes it look not you know, like appealing. She says, if they're the right colors, she says, it, it, you can tell it feels right, it looks good. The way they started patchwork is that these uh, white people that came, they wore their shirts, they see the patterns in their shirts, that's how they copied them. They were trying to imitate patterns on the shirts of the, you know, probably farmers, cowboys, ranchers, whatever the case may be. We didn't have no housing, we didn't have no education, we didn't have any school, we didn't have nothing here. BIA used to give us money for all that stuff, but they said, we didn't give you enough money, and you borrowed so much money that we, you can't pay it back, we're not going to be able to help you all no more. So we had to find another way to get money for the reservation. They live in the Chiqui. The chickies are leaking, no housing, nothing. And a lot of people stayed on the reservation and, you know, and, and lived by our tribal government and what we could get from BIA. And I think because my mom's dad was hunting and fishing and selling at a young age, that she didn't have any fear of going off the reservation to these tourist places and, and um, you know, doing what she had to do to make a living. This guy used to work for a... Uh, BIA in Hollywood. His name was Golden Clark. He says, I know what y'all can do. He says, people like to play bingo. And he said, if you start out with bingo on the reservation, he says, you have these rich people playing bingo. You can make money doing that. So that's how it got started. When the, the bingo and the cigarettes started, my concept was not, we need it. it it's great. I just thought, Oh, okay, well, whatever that is, you know, I just thought it was another form of, like, my mom doing souvenirs. You know, okay, we're starting a business. The county was against us. They gave us a hard time. They kept taking us to court on that bingo, trying to close it down. For some reason, I was young enough not to, to, to understand the impact of like going to court and the government challenges and, and the state challenges, and I, I really didn't get what it was all about until later years. It was on federal reservation. They finally figured that out, I guess they quit. So that's how we got by, having that bingo, and that's how it started out. The bingo came in the late 70s. It was enough money to help the tribe 
a little bit as a whole, but it wasn't a major impact because in the beginning we actually had management companies running them for us. So they were taking a piece off the top. Even after bingo and cigarettes, I wouldn't even say that uh, we got any real dividends until years later. It was very gradual. We'd get maybe two or three hundred dollars in dividend payments. By 1999, I believe, I think I was getting twelve hundred a month in tribal dividends after the Hard Rocks were built. You know, it jumped and it continued to jump. They did so well that our dividends jumped triple up to the point where an um, average tribal member is making over a hundred thousand a year now in, you know, just in dividend payments. Some people use money for a good purpose, use it for, a, for their family. My sister and I sometimes, you know, say, oh, it's a double-edged sword because we have so more, many more programs. We've built buildings just dedicated to the seniors where they can go and eat every day, where they can um, commiserate and, and have activities for them. You know, every tribal member has medical insurance, dental, medical, anything that they need. Housing has been a boom to the, to the tribe because of the gaming income. So there's uh, just as many good things, or if not more good things that you can say, as well as the bad side, which is, yes, people get crazy with money. Part of it is that in the early 90s, I believe it was, we finally had a, a, a settlement with the government on some lands from the um, 1800s, I believe, and we were paid some millions of dollars. Individually, it wasn't a whole lot of money because it was distributed among the tribal members. But the ones that were babies when that money was settled, when that settlement was done, had that money put in a, um, an account, an, an interest-bearing account. So those children at 18 were released that money. And it became very, you know, an issue because, you know, the first thing they did is they rented limousines and hotel rooms and partied like rock stars. And as a consequence, you know, we've lost a lot of young people within the last, say, 10 to 15 years. One tribal member said, you know what, I was raised on a, in a dirt floor chiki, you know, and then I'm making so, you know, this much money a year. You know, yeah, I went a little crazy. <laughs> and right now you can drive by just about any house on any reservation of the tribe, and there's not going to be one car. There's not going to be two cars. There's at least four, four to five cars. You want to have your truck, you want to have a Hummer, you want to have your sedan, you know, you want to have a Mercedes. I don't really think it helped me at all. Because nobody worries about making stuff and doing this or going out and earning money. They depend on that money every month. Some ladies that I know that would be able to so they don't do it. They don't know when they sew it anymore. Nobody makes dolls no more. Nobody makes baskets no more. It was said by the old people, but that if they didn't, they if they didn't kill us by the gun, they would kill us by the money. She was saying in the words in that we shouldn't. Um, value it so much. We shouldn't make it such an important thing. This is what I, I hope for our tribe is that, you know, anyone can be a little crazy with a lot of money, but it's like I said, you know, we come back to who we are. We are survivors, you know, we are caretakers of our own kind. So with money, it's just about helping others. I don't care if it's the you know, um, humane society. You know, we can donate. There's a lot, a lot of room for service. That, that is my hope, that we survive for a reason, not just a party. <laughs> Se mo sa ke mi kusha pal ke api anna.